Well, folks, it's that time again. That's right, it's time for me to show you a weird mouse. I was really running the clock out on that since uh, the last one of these was several months ago, but don't worry, it's apparently my lot in life to periodically receive a pointing device that either makes more sense or far less than the ones we all have on our desks. And it was worth the wait because this one definitely brings the noise if the noise is being bizarre. We have to start somewhere. So this is the Halo scanner mouse. And I know that's, that's a deeply evil sentence, but unfortunately it does exactly what it depicts on the box. It mouses and it scans. And that might seem silly, and it absolutely is. Anyway, let's, let's start with the basics. You can tell from the outside that this thing is cheap and crappy. Uh, the packaging has uh, the atmosphere of a watch that you get at a company holiday party, you know, one that's got their logo on it. You get home, you throw it away just immediately. We'll get into this later, but yes, that, that probably is what we're looking at here. It's definitely that uh, curiously lightweight paperboard that just like tears when you try to open it. So the price point here was definitely not high. Uh, now opening it up, there's a lot of superfluous plastic inside. Um, it has a driver disc, which kind of dates it. Uh, it's got a, uh, actually what turned out to be a remarkably serviceable manual with a decent amount of info and uh, you know good translation. Uh, and then under all this other paper junk is the mouse itself in more plastic trash. Here it is. Despite the uh, obvious cheapness, the feeling in the hand is actually not all that bad. Like the shape is not too terrible. Um, you know, it's just barely above tolerable. It's definitely a very inexpensive mouse. Uh, and you can tell because the top has that very shiny finish that always tells you something was made for just a couple bucks. You know, you gotta wipe the fingerprints off of it every single time you use it. But that said, it, it doesn't really feel all that lightweight or rattly like you might expect. It's not as, as airy as you might expect. It feels more or less like a mouse that would come with a pre-built computer. There's decent click on the buttons and on the wheel. Um, the rolling detents are a little vague. As a mouse, it works nominally. <laughs> There's no reason to even demo it. It's a mouse, it mouses. We're here to look at what makes it special. So about that, on the side here is a button that says scan. And below that are these two printed arrows which show you where you can find the edges of this, which is just what it looks like. It's a glass plate that exposes a huge hole on the bottom of the mouse. That's why this thing isn't featherweight, uh, because while a mouse of this quality would typically have nothing more than a, a little tiny circuit board inside, this one has a bunch of stuff. This window allows the scanning mechanism to look out. They aren't using some other definition of, of scanner here. This is a document scanner. You're supposed to use this to capture receipts, forms, photos, pages from books, that sort of thing. Now, I don't need to insult your intelligence. It's not gonna be any wacky YouTube voice like, how could this be possible nonsense? Uh, I'm sure you have no trouble guessing the basics of how this probably works. The big questions are, is it a good idea? Does it work well? Would you ever want one and why do it? This is not the only type of handheld scanner. Uh, there's very conventional ones that have been around for ages and they are a good idea. They're handy for anything that you can't fit easily on top of a flatbed scanner or through an automatic document feeder. They've been around for decades. So if someone had told me, hey, you can buy a mouse with a scanner in it like 20 years ago, my thoughts in order would have been, oh, that seems absurd. And then, oh, I think I see how they do that. And then, oh, that seems absurd again. And it is, it's, it's pretty silly, it's pretty awkward. Um, let's tell you that up front, right? Spoiler warning. But there is some cleverness going on here. So let's get it set up and see how it works. Per the manual copyright date, this was made in about 2013. So unlike a lot of stuff I look at on this channel, uh, it didn't ship with you know only drivers for Windows 98 or XP. The included software supports Windows 7. So unsurprisingly, you can use this on Windows 10. Just put the disk in, install it, no problem. Of course, you never wanna do that. The drivers that come with things are always hideously outdated. Um, often they have entire features that don't work. So I went to the uh, manufacturer's website, which is halo2cloud.com, weird name, uh, but I didn't find any reference to this thing. Uh, it seems like uh, this company only tried to sell any computer peripherals for a brief period in the early 2010s, and then they went back to their bread and butter, uh, hideously cheap lithium ion power banks that will probably burn your house down, uh, cheap LED flashlights, etc. 
So I did what I usually do. I went to Internet Archive. I pulled up an old copy of the site and I downloaded the updated drivers, which to my great amusement proceeded to self-update themselves as soon as I installed them. So apparently they never took down the part of their site that the updater talks to, which I admit is a first in my experience. Usually the downloads on the site last longer than the automatic updates. But sure enough, it installed and it runs just fine on Windows 10, which is what I have here on this laptop. So uh, brass tacks, uh, I've installed the software and to use this, uh, let's just get a document here. This is a fax that somebody sent me during my 100,000 subscriber uh, special live show. By the way, I'm sorry to everyone who, who sent faxes. I got about 4,000 and couldn't even begin to read them all on stream. Uh, but here's one that I don't think made it. So we take the mouse, we put it on top of the document, and we press the button on the side. The software immediately blanks the entire screen, which the first time this happened, I just about... Well, anyway, it surprised me. I thought my machine had just crashed, but uh, sure enough, a moment later, uh, an image from the scanner appears. Now, from the aspect ratio, you can probably guess that it's only capturing what's inside that glass window on the bottom. Now, this immediately tells us that this doesn't work like a conventional hand scanner. See, when I first saw this device, I assumed that you'd hit the button and then you'd have to move the mouse very carefully and steadily in one direction without wavering at all. You know, like doing a panorama on an old digital camera before they got the accelerometers. Uh, you'd have to move like this and if you jiggled up and down at all, it would destroy the image. And then you'd have to move the mouse down at the end of the line and do it all again to capture another line and repeat, and then it would maybe stick them all together in post-processing. Um, and that might work, uh, but it would suck. Uh, and I know exactly how much it would suck because I had that exact experience with the uh, portable copiers that I reviewed last year. Uh, it was a bunch of devices that came out in the mid 80s, had little scanning heads and built-in thermal printers, and you drag them across a sheet of paper and it would make a copy of it on the fly. Uh, the trouble is they'd only take these little bites, maybe a couple inches wide. So you'd have to scan a little bit and then move down and scan a little bit more. And the result wouldn't really assemble into the original document. It was all pretty disappointing. Um, not really what anybody would have wanted out of that kind of product. And sure enough, they all failed after a year or two on the market. Not because they were a bad concept, just because they weren't very well thought out. So I had worried that this would be similar. If it's as cheaply designed as it looks, most of the ways I can think of to do what it's doing on the cheap wouldn't work much better than that. But fortunately, many decades have gone by since the ancient days of the 80s, and this uses far more modern methods. Okay, before I continue, uh, this just died while I was trying to demo it, uh, just in the middle of using it, it just quit working. And we'll talk more about that later, because I actually already had something in the script about how unreliable these things are. But if you're thinking about buying one, don't. Uh, it lasted maybe 20 minutes of use uh, before it just completely quit working. Um, however, I did capture some footage earlier uh, so I can show you what it looks like when it's functioning. Uh, so just pretend that I'm moving the mouse in sync with the footage you're about to see. Here's what you actually do with it. Just move the mouse any which way you please. Up, down, left, right any sequence, and as you move, the software will fill in parts of the image as you pass over them. You can jiggle it around, you can move it at different speeds, you can go surprisingly fast and even overlap parts of the image you've already scanned and it's no problem. Your motion doesn't need to be perfectly straight and it doesn't even need to be plumb. If you rotate the mouse, instead of the scan getting distorted, the software just rotates its view of the document right along with it. The only thing you can't do is pick the mouse up. It'll get upset if you do that and it'll ask you to put it back down in a spot that you've scanned before. Uh, but once you do, it takes a couple moments, gets its bearings and then marches right on. It ignores any bits of the document you already have. So as long as you cover every part at least once, before long, you'll have a complete picture like this one. For the most part, it looks surprisingly decent, especially since it was captured with something called a scanner mouse. Any output is kind of surprising, especially <laughs> <laughs> with what we know now, uh, but this actually doesn't look half bad. It is messy around the edges, uh, but I don't think that's avoidable. Uh, conventional scanners don't let you move in arbitrary directions, so they can make a perfectly rectangular image because they know exactly what they're scanning ahead of time. This can't know that. So it lets you move however you like, uh, and it just leaves the borders all messy, and then once you finish scanning, you press the scan button again, and then it applies some heuristics to figure out where the document actually is. So it'll try to rotate it so it's facing right side up and then it'll try to crop down to the interesting part of the image. 
It seems to do a decent job of this. Um, it doesn't get the crop super close, but you can adjust that easily. And if it gets the rotation wrong, you can tweak it by just rotating the picture, which is honestly a lot nicer than most scanning software. But unfortunately, that's the only thing this has to offer. Uh, the only other editing tools are not too hot. Um, there's an eraser, for instance, which doesn't even have soft edges. Uh, and you can apply some basic color corrections. Uh, but those are limited to hue and saturation, which are not terribly useful with a normal document, uh, and to brightness and contrast, which are incredibly crude. They only have about six steps of adjustment each, uh, which is uh, kind of shockingly bad. I don't even know why it would be like that. It's like software from the 80s. And in addition, most modern software, you know, made in the late 2000s or afterwards, has an exposure control instead of brightness and contrast that adjusts the response curve of the image to simulate changes in actual exposure time. Brightness and contrast adjustments are better than nothing, but they're very crude in comparison. The only remaining features in this software appear when you click OK. Uh, your scan pops up in this little dialog where you can choose to send it to a few different social networks, you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, or you can save it as a JPEG or a PNG. You can also save as four different document formats, uh, doc, uh, TXT, PDF, or XLS. So after scanning this fax, uh, I can view it as a PDF with selectable text uh, that I can just copy out. Uh, this is very convenient and of course not impressive or rare at all. OCR has been around in scanning software for decades and looking at the driver disk, it seems to just be an embedded copy of Fine Reader from ABBYY, which has been around for eons as well. So what we have here is pretty much a minimum viable product. Uh, if it didn't include at least these features, it would almost be fraudulent and there's nothing more than that. You've seen everything it does. There's no document management system or anything like that. Uh, in fact, if you just press the scan button again by accident, your scan goes away. It's like beep, 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 and, and your scan is gone. I actually did that while recording this video, and I had to go back and dig those files out of a temp folder that it hadn't erased yet. Now, it's not that a scanner should include a bunch of extraneous software, you know, bloatware, but the fact that this one doesn't, coupled with the rudimentary nature of what it does have and the cheap assemblage of the device itself, makes this whole thing feel almost like a proof of concept, which I think it pretty much is. See, as you've probably guessed, uh, the company whose name is on the box, this Halo, they had nothing to do with making it. Uh, in the installer, down the corner, it says, powered by Dakota. And when you see that phrase on something, it means this is who actually made it. And that certainly seems to be the case here. Dakota was a Swiss company uh, who seemed to have been founded in the early 2010s, specifically to license this and other advanced scanning technologies. Uh, they registered like 10 patents the moment they were founded to give you an idea what their whole thing was about. Uh, their website in the present day is still around, but it just contains an admonition to scanner mouse owners that they don't provide end user support. So it seems like maybe this is the only product they ever got to market. There's also a series of links to various companies who sold these things. And if you flip through those, it is immediately apparent that none of them had anything to do with making them. Uh, all of them look exactly the same. Uh, so we can guess that Dakuda designed this entire product, uh, probably farmed it out to one factory to manufacture, uh, but didn't want to deal with distributors, retailers, and end users. So they let some middlemen get involved to do all the marketing and vendor relations and customer support, yeah, as if. So we can guess that these all rolled off the same production line. They probably made them in just black and white. Uh, and the vendors differentiated them just by customizing the plastic cap that snaps on top. I can actually assure you of that part because to uh, no one's surprise, I have two of these. Uh, that's thanks to one of my patrons, Indrora, who saw them at the store and knowing how I am, uh, snatched up both of them and hung on to them for months while I was too busy having bad brain to come pick them up. Uh, they also helped me out with some new SSDs when the one I was using for editing video died just five months after I bought it. So I want to thank them very much for being a lifesaver. As you can see, the box here has in fact just fallen apart just from me opening it. Uh, and if we open it up, it looks much the same, but a little different. For one thing, it has a newer version of the software, which I normally wouldn't care about, except that this one comes on a DVD, while the other one comes on just a CD. 
Now it's bizarre for a driver to require a whole 4.7 gigs of storage, but I'm pretty sure that's because it's the combined PC and Mac version, while the other one is only for Windows. You're supposed to download the Mac software for that one. Since the PC software is about 400 megs, for some reason I can't fathom, uh, I assume the Mac version is also that size, which is just enough bigger than a CD that they had to go with a whole DVD, which is kind of tragically funny. In every other respect though, these are completely identical. As you can see, it's got exactly the same bottom, uh, but this one has a different top plate, as we expected, with a sort of a squiggly purple uh, low-rent Louis Vuitton thing going on, instead of the unsightly you know, doctor's waiting room clock advertising Ambien look of the first one. Uh, my guess is that these are basically distributor samples, uh, the sort of thing sent out by companies that don't do anything other than put their name on stuff they didn't make. Uh, this Halo outfit probably wanted to be the sort of place you call if you are trying to get cheap crappy watches to give away at company parties to employees you don't know and want to pretend you respect. Uh, they would have sent these two mice to someone, probably unbidden, uh, who proceeded to never unbox them, they were all sealed up when I got them, uh, and then throw them away a decade later. Uh, this happens a lot. Now, in this part of the script, I was going to say the main difference uh, is that this one doesn't work, uh, and that one does, but as it turns out, they both lasted about 10 minutes. I just hadn't run this one long enough to kill it. Now, they're not completely dead. Let me show you what they do. The scanning process starts, but if I don't touch it, hands off, and just wait, yeah, it, it starts doing this. The mouse just sort of uh, starts jumping all over the place, uh, getting confused about how the document is actually shaped uh, and just uh, randomly zooming in and out uh, for no reason that I can ascertain. It's very weird. It's a failure mode I've never seen in anything before. I mean, I've done my best. I've uh, cleaned the glass. I've cleaned uh, everything else about it. Uh, I've unplugged it, replugged it, tried it on a different machine, etc. It's just useless now. And they're both broken in the exact same way. So, yeah, we know it's broken because it's, you know, bottom of the barrel disposable trash. These devices were born to be e-waste. You know, the, the, the production line should have just ended directly in a landfill because that's where they were destined from the moment they were created. But still, I'm surprised that they failed in such a specific way. Like, I would expect a device like this to just, you know, short out. You plug it into your PC, it says USB port overcurrent detected. It just doesn't work. Instead, it does this this very specific, very bizarre, uh, kind of Cronenbergian <laughs> failure mode. <laughs> and th they both died in the exact same way. They're both doing it. Wh what? What's going on? <laughs> I gotta tell you, this video was gonna be a lot different before this one died. Not only have they both soft failed, but they've soft failed in precisely the same way. So whatever's going on here is some sort of design defect. Which isn't all that surprising, because if we take a look at how this actually functions, uh, at least as much as we can suss out from the hardware, one thing that's clear is that this is more sophisticated than it really probably should be. Um, from what I'm going to show you of the innards, I'd say that Dakota reached just a, a little too far. They flew too close to the sun and made a device that was just a bit too complicated to make this cheaply. Let's see if you agree. If we uh, flip the mouse over and take a look down inside, we can see a lot going on right away. Underneath the glass, uh, you can see a mirror, and that's reflecting two things. First, there's a pair of LED illuminators to you know, light up the document. And second, there's the very distinct shape of an integrated camera module. Now from those parts alone, we can suss out how this device works, uh, or we can just confirm it with United States patent number 201601737716, among others. They registered a lot of them. It's very dense, um, but if you want, you can read it yourself and confirm, but it pretty much lines up with how you'd think this would work if you just looked at it. Basically, the little camera in there is a webcam that points at the surface underneath the mouse, and it takes photos continuously as you move it around and sends them to the software on your PC, which is where pretty much all the magic happens. Now, I should explain a bit about how this differs from a conventional scanner. Even the handheld scanners sold now, and the flatbeds, and pretty much everything else are essentially identical to the ones that were being sold in the 80s. Uh, they really haven't changed in all that time. 
The most important thing that stayed the same is that they all use linear image sensors. Uh, these are sort of like digital camera sensors, but they only capture a single line of pixels, not a complete rectangular picture. That's why the scanning head inside of a flatbed scanner has to move very slowly across the surface of the document. It can only capture one line at a time, so it has to do it over and over and over and over to build up a complete image. Now this ancient technique is still in use because it works. Compared to all but the highest quality cameras on the market, linear imagers achieve phenomenal resolution and quality at pretty low cost and complexity. The trade-off is that even at their best, they're usually pretty slow. Uh, even the modern handheld ones require you to stay under a certain maximum speed or they'll start dropping samples and that wrecks your scan. So this has been a no-brainer for consumer document imaging for decades, but in the 2000s, new scanners became available that used ordinary cameras because digital cameras became incredibly cheap. They used to cost a fortune, but by the middle of the aughts, you could get a full-color digital camera module for probably a buck or two. The image, the color quality, the light sensitivity, the resolution, they were gonna be pretty poor, right? Especially compared to a conventional scanner. But there's one very special feature. They're fast. Because a camera takes a whole rectangular photo all at once, you can capture a lot more document at a time. And that led to entirely new types of document scanner, like overhead stand scanners, which are literally just a webcam suspended over a tabletop. You put a document under it, you press a button, and just like that, you've got the entire thing on your laptop. It's not the same quality as a flatbed, but it is instantaneous. Now the downside is that those take up a lot of space, uh, much like most scanners, and they only work with documents up to a specific size. If your stand scanner is about this tall, then you're only gonna be able to capture about this much surface area. If you have something bigger, well, you're, you're kinda out of luck. Now, if you want an option with potentially higher quality that can also be used for documents of virtually any size, then there's always been the option to just use a conventional digital camera and just take photos of small portions of a document one at a time until you've covered the whole thing and then put them all together in post-processing. This isn't necessarily faster than a conventional scanner, but it has its advantages. Uh, you don't have to reserve a large dedicated scanning area uh, for it. It's just a camera you can take to whatever you need to photograph. It's highly flexible. The thing that you're scanning can be any shape you want. The trouble is just that you have to use a camera, very carefully position it, and then stitch the images together manually after the fact. This device essentially automates that whole process. So as you saw when we started the scan, it immediately popped a whole chunk of the facts onto the screen at once in the center of an infinite canvas. So it's taking a whole photograph of one part of the page, and then as we move and it sees new parts of the document, it applies what I assume is a ton of very wacky math to figure out how the new images relate to the old ones. And it does this by correlating the shapes in the new and old pictures. In other words, the software lays the most recent photo over the last one it got, then slides them around until the words or lines or whatever match up. And once it's done that, it can measure the distance between the features, and that tells it how far you move the scanner in between shots. That, in turn, tells it which part of the image is new data and which is old. So it can throw out the old and then add the new to the canvas. Now this is really clever, because if you think about a conventional scanner, uh, one of the downsides of it is that every single scan, every image it takes, has no context. Every time a linear imager images a new strip of the page, it only has new data, and it doesn't know how it relates to the old data. So if the document moved, if it slipped, if it curled in between images, it won't know that, and your resulting document won't be accurate. This is why flatbed scanners have a lid on top to make sure the document is held firmly in place and up against the glass. Now this is a perennial issue with handheld scanners, which by their nature are meant to work with loose documents that can slide all over if you're not careful. So as you're dragging something over it, it has a tendency to slip. Here, however, if you don't move the mouse with absolute perfection and the document does slip around, it's okay because every capture is a whole photograph. It doesn't just include new image data. They're taken frequently enough that it has overlapping data, redundant information, which can be used to figure out from scratch, if need be, where the scanner is on the page. Uh, imagine assembling a jigsaw puzzle if all the pieces had margins overhanging the sides that showed the contents of the adjacent pieces. So you'd still be figuring out how it all fit together by comparing how the lines meet at the edges of the pieces. But you'd also see the context for each one. 
and that would make it a lot easier. Now, it would be possible to do this whole trick entirely with dead reckoning, you know, just matching a series of images up using this correlation technique. Uh, that'd be similar to what's called stitching, uh, what people do with uh, panoramas, where software finds the connections between images to figure out how to stick them together. But, of course, there's also a long history of hilarious or disturbing results when the panorama process goes wrong, uh, which happens when there isn't enough context or when things look similar when they aren't. Now, you can make this process easier and more reliable by adding more info about how the scanner is being moved in the real world. If the software knows the scanner moved about half an inch up and to the right in between shots, then it can start from that rough position when it tries to figure out where a new image goes on the canvas. That way it doesn't have to search the entire canvas to find all possible locations the latest image could fit. It knows it goes within some particular region, and that makes the search process much shorter. All it has to do is fine tune the results. Now what kind of device might be good at tracking motion over a surface? How about a mouse? If we take a look back at the bottom, you'll see that in addition to the camera window, there's what looks like an opening for a normal optical mouse sensor here. It is in kind of a weird place way up here towards the front. But what's even stranger than that is that down here at the bottom, there's a second one. Now, if both of those are mouse sensors, then this is a bizarre way to use them. So let's take a look inside. Let's see how this is built. Find out what the heck they're doing here. The first thing you'll notice as I open this up is how busy it is. There's actually a flying lead connecting the top shell to the bottom, which you have to unplug. Now. <laughs> The other mice I've opened up on my channel before are all shockingly simple inside. I mean, even when they were weird, they still had very few components. Um, one of them didn't even have any screws. This one, on the other hand, um, yeah, there, there's some stuff going on in there. The flying lead is really strange um, for a cheap device because a cheap mouse with side buttons would always mount the buttons on the main PCB in the bottom so they would only have to make one board. A whole extra PCB is hanging out up here, and that's a wild extravagance in you know both manufacturing and assembly. I mean, yeah, the PCB is cheap, but the cheapest part is the one you didn't need. There's also actually a light behind the scan button, which is kind of redundant since, you know, if you're scanning, well, the, the window's gonna be open on your PC, you don't need this to remind you. But at any rate, it still doesn't need a separate board for that. I mean, most manufacturers would just put an LED on the main board with very long legs and just bend it to point out the side button. So right away, I suspect that as cheap as this device looks and feels, it probably wasn't designed by someone with cost engineering in mind. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the chassis may be kind of cheap, but the circuitry looks like the first draft from an engineer with very few optimizations before it went to manufacturing. So my guess is that this design really did come straight out of Dakota, rather than just being a concept that was implemented by an ODM who definitely would have simplified and cheapened the hell out of it. Not just to be cheaper and shittier, but for legitimate optimization. I mean, why have a whole separate PCB with more fasteners and more affordances on the case and a whole extra cable and plug that probably has to be assembled by hand when you could lose all of that for really no downside? I don't think any of this really gets you anything, but it's the sort of design you see from engineers who aren't thinking about cost or manufacturing margins. We'll see more of this as we go deeper. The bottom half here is jam-packed with excitement. There's no fewer than three separate printed circuit boards, uh, the largest of which is cut into a complicated U shape to fit around this uh, sort of doghouse, which uh, houses the mirror on this 45 degree face. And then it has the camera and the LED illuminators on these other very oddly angled faces. I don't know why they did that, but I've never been very good at geometry. And again, these boards have more of that uh, kind of engineer design feeling. Like I'm no big Clive, I can't reverse this and explain how it all works, but to my eyes, it still looks like they used more parts than they strictly needed to. The LED board, for instance, has a whole bunch of power supply components on it. There's some inductors and transistors, and instead of just receiving its power from a controller on the main board, it has inputs here for control and strobe. I don't know what control would be. Strobe makes sense since it does strobe when it's running. Um, look away if you're photosensitive, flickering lights. All right, we good? Here's what the LEDs do when you're actually scanning something. 
All right, you can look back now. And the reason for that is the same reason you'd use strobes in photography, because a strobe uh, is such a brief flash of light that even if your shutter isn't fast enough to freeze motion, the light will do it for you. In industrial machine vision applications, like you know, taking pictures of biscuits uh, moving down a conveyor belt, uh, they do the same thing. They use strobe lights because it freezes the product in place, so you can get a very clean image of it without having to use extremely bright continuous lights and an extremely high shutter speed on your camera. So I get the strobing, I just don't know why the control circuitry is on this little board instead of on the main board, which would have saved a whole separate PCB and let them just hot glue the LEDs in place. So again, engineer design. Now there's not a ton going on on the camera board in here because they used highly integrated parts. So there's a single EEPROM on the back and then everything else is passive except right next to the camera itself there's a chip labeled OV00538. Now that is a fully integrated camera image processor and USB interface from a company called Omnivision. This kind of product allows you to take any compatible camera module, run a few wires into this cheap chip, and then put a USB cable on the other side of it, and bam, you've got a finished cheap as dirt webcam ready to put in a plastic case and sell, which is essentially what we have here, just with dipping mustards. This device actually shows up in Windows as a standard USB video class device, and I can open it up in OBS and get an image. I mean, it's chopped up and garbled, probably because it's not sending out a normal pixel format, but you can just about make out my face if you look hard enough. So this really is essentially just a webcam. Of course, that's just the image component. The motion data isn't present here. Uh, it's not like embedded in the picture or anything, so it has to be getting in some other way. That would be through the second USB device that shows up when you plug this thing in. See, this mouse is what's called a USB composite device, which is a single USB unit that provides multiple functions as if it were multiple devices. And the other one that shows up is a HID, or human interface device, which usually refers to a keyboard or a mouse. And that brings us to the only other real parts in here, which are what we came for, the two sensors. Those are these two little gray wafers on the bottom PCB, and sure enough, they're completely ordinary optical mouse sensors, the exact kind of thing you'd find in any old $5 wheel mouse. Uh, these happen to be made by Avago, but as far as I know, there are dozens of sources for these, and they all look and work the exact same way, going all the way back to about 1997. Now, these are pretty sophisticated little devices. Um, they're basically tiny, high-resolution digital cameras married to specialized processors that actually do the same trick as the scanner software. They take a series of pictures and they correlate them to figure out what movement would have produced the changes they're seeing. Then they report that motion to your PC as mouse movement. Now, at first, seeing the two of these, I had some pretty cynical thoughts, because this could be an even cheaper device than it looks. The top sensor could be providing all the mouse functionality, literally just uh, plugging into your PC as a mouse, unrelated to the whole rest of this. And then the bottom one could be providing the locating data for the scanner, and the two could just be totally independent. I've seen this approach in the cheapest sludge on the market before, just two unrelated devices that happen to come in the same package, uh, like an FM radio with a terrible little LED flashlight on it. Uh, it's called a value add, and I, I kind of figured that's what was going on here but it definitely isn't. If I put a piece of tape over the upper aperture, the mouse stops working as a mouse. I can move it around and the pointer won't do anything. And if I cover the lower sensor, it causes no such issues. So it looks for a moment like they really aren't related to each other, but check this out. This is hard to demo since this thing is now half broken, but if I start a scan and move it around with both apertures open, you can see when it's not glitching that it mostly follows the movement of my hand. Well now let's do it with the bottom aperture covered up. As I move, it still notices that it's moving, so it is using data from the top sensor. But without this second input, it gets even more confused than it was and starts going in circles, even when I'm moving normally. If we cover the top hole instead, it does the same thing. So both sensors definitely play a role in the scanning feature. Now, if you've seen my previous videos where I looked at early optical mouse designs from the 80s, it might seem likely that it's using one sensor for the vertical orientation and one for the horizontal. And sure enough, they do seem to be rotated by 90 degrees, which would suggest that. But I don't think it's quite that simple. If it was, then covering up one of them would leave the other fully functional. So it might get confused, uh, but it should still move in at least one axis normally. Instead, it, it barely moves at all, it just kind of rotates in place. 
So I assume that they're performing some nasty trigonometric matrix transform I can hope to understand, and covering up one of the sensors makes it behave weirdly because it plugs all zeros into one side of that calculation, which it's not designed for. I'll admit I, I don't really know how any of that works, so I could be way off base. But at any rate, it's clear from this demo that both sensors play a crucial role in the scanning feature, and the patent does describe one and two sensor versions of the invention. So this all seems to be on the level. I am a little unclear still on how the data gets back to the PC in a couple senses. The output from both sensors must be getting funneled back through that one HID device in Windows, but I'm not sure where they're putting the extra data. It shows up just like a normal mouse, which typically just have two axes of input, so I'm not sure how this is working. I did notice that during scanning, I can move the cursor around on screen with a second mouse just fine, but when I move this one, it doesn't affect the cursor. So apparently, in scan mode, it stops reporting the normal X and Y mouse motion, which is weird, but it's probably just an extension of HID that I don't know about, and a bunch of people will explain it in the comments. Secondly, though, I suspect the USB implementation here is pretty strange. See, the image processor for the camera, that OmniVision chip, has a native USB interface. You can just wire it straight into a PC with no extra support components. But the mouse sensors don't do that. They only output a serial data stream, so something has to be converting their signals to USB. Now, there is one more chip in this mouse. Uh, it's between these two sensors under the doghouse. It's labeled ST840, and I can't identify it, but I'm guessing that it's just a, a Jelly Bean microcontroller. And while that could be producing the USB interface, I'm pretty certain that it isn't. See, this mouse shows up in Windows as a USB composite device, not a hub, which means there can't be two different USB clients in here. It's gotta be one that's handling both features. Now, since the OmniVision definitely acts as a complete USB device, I have to assume that Dakota programmed the OmniVision to take the serial data from the sensors and present it as the USB HID component. The specs do say that that chip has room for program code, so presumably it's intended for this sort of thing, but it's still kind of a wild way to do things. Those are both minor mysteries, however, the rest of this thing is all pretty much by the book. It's a little less cost engineered than most devices, but it's still all cheap off the shelf parts, and almost everything seems to happen in software. In fact, because the parts are so cheap, the software seems to be doing some amount of heavy lifting to make it all work at all. Like any cheap camera sensor, the image is noisy and doesn't have amazing color, so if you watch uh, during a scan, you can see there's some noise and some variations in the image quality there. The pictures aren't perfectly similar in terms of color and brightness, probably because the camera isn't perfectly timed with the strobing LEDs. So as you scan, the software has to compensate a little bit to make everything look consistent. And even though it notionally knows where each image goes, the stitching process still blends the edges of every capture together, sort of like the Photoshop healing brush, to smooth out any errors. Unfortunately, it doesn't do a perfect job. Sometimes it starts to get a little out of sync with reality and begins blending together things that don't actually fit. Uh, in particular, if you travel a long distance away from the start of a scan and then return to it, you usually find that the rotation or the positioning are now a little bit off and you start to get discontinuities. In fact, before this mouse died, uh, I did a scan which mostly looked good until the end when it suddenly bled a big chunk of the table into the document. So as clever as it is to use uh, mouse sensors and correlation for this process, it apparently doesn't actually keep up. There seems to be some amount of tracking error where the idea of where the mouse is doesn't quite add up over time. And this doesn't matter all that much overall. Like if you just scan a document all in one go, it probably looks okay. But if you were to look close enough, you'd find that it's slightly rotated or stretched across the entire width. Not really a showstopper, except that if you're promising that you can go back and scan portions of the image you've already captured and that doesn't actually work, well, that's not really a very good product, is it? You could call this a nitpick, but in practice, every time I tried to scan something, when this was functioning, it did great at first, uh, and then invariably, if it took more, invariably, if it took more than a few seconds to complete the scan, I'd end up coming back to a previous spot and getting jumbled up results. And apparently, there's some other problems. It gets absolutely defeated by highly reflective surfaces, which is a problem that optical mice used to have, but laser mice never did. Now this does use laser mouse sensors, and the first laser mouse I ever used would operate on glass with no trouble, so I don't know what this is about, but it means that things like CD cases are impossible to scan, even though they would work fine on a flatbed scanner. 
In fact, there's a number of things that are much harder to scan with this than you'd think. Uh, for instance, uh, there's advertisements saying you can scan photos and receipts, but neither one of those really works. Um, with a photo, for instance, you'd think you could just you know, pass the mouse over it two or three times and have the whole thing, but it doesn't really work because you have to hold it in place. So instead, you have to pin it down with a finger and then sort of scan around that, and then you, you miss a big swath here, so you've got to sort of rotate to fit to the finger, and then you do this dance of moving the finger, and then find that you miss something over here, so you've got to move back like that, and, and, and we're in hell, and this is horrible, right? This is not better than a flatbed scanner. Receipts are even worse. Um, the paper is so weak that uh, no matter how you scan it, it's just going to, to move underneath it, right? So holding it one place isn't good enough because it's not stiff enough uh, for that to work. And you don't really have a way to hold it in both places. And um, you can't really get it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's, it's a made up idea. This application never could have actually worked no matter how well they made this product. And of course, um, anything that contains staples is gonna hang up the mouse or cause it to catch and drag the paper with it. Uh, and of course, it runs the risk of scratching this irreplaceable window, which would surely ruin it. Uh, and all these problems, of course, don't exist with flatbed scanners because the moving head is protected by the platen. So you can put whatever you want on top of them and it usually won't cause any damage. I could go on and on about the many tasks this has trouble with, but there's no point because there's almost no reason to buy one. Um, even if it did work, and even if it was an interesting idea in 2013, just a couple years later at most, it was pretty much obsolete. For most people, it's a lot easier to just take a photo with a smartphone. I mean, you could do that in 2013, but cameras got a lot better very quickly, uh, and probably by 2015, and certainly nowadays, you could just take a photo and get a pretty reasonable printout from it. Um, you can get any of hundreds of apps now that let you take a picture of a document and have it converted instantly into something that looks as good as a flatbed scan for most intents and purposes. So honestly, even when this was new, there was probably very little demand especially because an awful lot of people have room in their lives for a conventional scanner, especially because of multifunction printers. If you already want to own a printer, adding the scanning function doesn't increase the footprint any, so it's essentially free. The only feature that really leaves on the table is the prospect of scanning unusually sized or shaped documents, which to be fair is still apparently an unsolved problem. I was certain if I went to the Android app store, you know, looked up some reviews, looked around Reddit, I would eventually find a program for my phone that would solve this problem by using the accelerometer and the video camera and having you just pan over a document from about a foot away and it would slowly assemble a scan just like this does and then, you know, correct its aspect ratio and everything in post. Nobody seems to make this. I actually couldn't find any solution to this. If you have a large document to scan, I guess the only thing you can do is bring it to someone who has a large specialty scanner. And you'd really think that Android would be the solution, but this is the special kind of hell that mobile brings. If you want a feature that absolutely everybody else wants, then yeah, there will probably be an app for that. But as soon as you want something that's not in the number one app in the store, you start digging through increasingly sketchy offerings. And after a little bit, you realize they're all exactly the same. So if it's possible to do this now, I don't know how. And that's probably why these things are still being sold and even have a few diehard fans. Uh, you can get one on Amazon for between 40 and $100 and there are still people in the reviews calling it the best scanner ever made. Of course, there are also some pretty harsh complaints, uh, some regarding how it interacts with media other than plain, flat, full-size sheets of paper, uh, and others reporting that the software is buggy and claims to run out of memory when it should have plenty still available, stuff like that. Uh, the physical issues are, of course, not surprising at all. You know, maybe a handheld scanner using a webcam sensor is a good idea, one that could really do gangbusters. But wrapping that idea up into something shaped like a mouse means it has to have a bunch of extra plastic around it that's not oriented towards its primary goal, which means it can only possibly make it more awkward to use. If this thing was more streamlined, if it was more focused on just the scanning feature, then I suspect I would have fewer problems with photos and with receipts. But it's too busy being a mouse to focus on its supposed primary task. It's kind of a shame how things like this can end up being gimmicks when they actually could have been decent products. I don't know why Dakota decided that this would be the only form this should exist in, uh, one that combines two unrelated features that very few people really need to merge. And I am certain that Dakota is responsible. I think they made the entire design, the case, the circuitry, even the software. 
If you look at screenshots of the drivers for versions from other companies like the Iris Scan and even the one that LG rebranded, it's obvious that nobody ever touched the software. They, they didn't get an API or anything. They just took what Dakota sent them, a sample app, and just pressed it right onto a disk. This was never a technology. It was just one product. And it was never an industry. It was just a single experimental idea that never really got expanded on. As far as I can tell, Dakota never tried to. Uh, at first, they tried to relabel this software and sell it in a different package through a Kickstarter in 2014 for a product called Pocket Scan, uh, which actually got funded, uh, showing that people do want something like this. Uh, it was even manufactured, but everyone who received one seems to hate it. Uh, one person called it the Pocket Scam, and everyone seems to say the software is terrible. Uh, a couple years later, they pivoted into VR gear. Uh, they made a bunch of appearances at shows trying to spin up the PR machine on social media, uh, and they apparently succeeded at what they were probably trying to do all along, get bought. When a small company gets purchased, you can usually assume that they were founded in the first place in order to get purchased. And this is a perfect capsule summary of why my channel isn't typically about newer products. When you look at something from 1988 or 95, or 2003, it might be absolutely ridiculous. It might be a moonshot designed by people who were far smarter than they were sensible, uh, or one that was forgotten by a market that never appreciated what it was. Or it might have been an incredibly dumb idea that never had legs, and only made it to market because of executives getting high on their own supply. But the consistent element is that people usually were trying to make a product in order to sell it. But when you get to the 2010s, all that goes away. See, uh, I remember this thread on Twitter a while back uh, where security researchers were talking about how things used to be compared to how they are now, and the lament that several of them shared was that nowadays when you're tracking down some remarkable exploit, a, a brilliant network worm, or a clever rootkit, you can go through days of analysis. You can figure out all the novel techniques they used, reverse their obfuscations and compression and indirection, and when you finally make it to the payload, it's a Bitcoin miner. It's always a Bitcoin miner, apparently. Never anything else. It's not going to steal your data or try to read your email. It's not going to try and make a backdoor. It's just going to mine crypto. And it saps your will to live, also. It makes it hard to do a job that you used to find fascinating when you find out that at the end of every question is the same answer. It's the only answer to almost every security question in the last eight years or so. And that's what electronics turned into after the 2000s. Uh, every time a product doesn't make sense, it's because it wasn't supposed to. Nobody makes anything anymore. There haven't been any products in years. The things that actually get produced are side effects. They're byproducts of a process that is not intended to make something you can buy, but to make a business something another business can buy. It's to grant windfalls to three or four executives when their startup gets purchased, who will then walk away from the team and the patents, all of which they created in bad faith, uh, not caring what happens to them afterwards, which is usually that the technology disappears forever, and eventually, after doing nothing for years, the team gets dissolved, and they go off to find new jobs. Just one of thousands of acquisitions, line items on shareholder reports by some megacorp, or even some other group of liars who were themselves trying to get bought by someone even bigger. But all along the trajectory, with all these companies intersecting, buying each other, getting bought, going out of business, and starting up, there is never any intent to actually make a product. Just about everything from the Nest thermostat to Meraki firewalls was only created with the intent of getting someone to pay way too much money while the executives walk away and forget what happens to the company, and for the acquiring company to just forget that they exist. And I would guess that uh, this is really no different. I doubt it was ever supposed to really work. I doubt it was ever supposed to make sense. I doubt you are ever really supposed to buy one. Uh, if they didn't put it on Amazon, then it would be too obvious that they were basically fake. Um, you know, essentially just a stockholder scam. It's what all companies are now but they have to put something out on the market to pretend that they are actually a manufacturer of physical goods, uh, or it'll just be a little too obvious what they're doing. That's the story, over and over, of everything now. It's the only answer to any question about consumer electronics, and that's why I stick to earlier eras, when companies made things that may have been terrible, but were actually supposed to be products, not just bait. So next time, we'll probably go back to the past, when things were probably just as evil, but at least not as banal. Uh, for now, though, that's all I have to say about this. So if you enjoyed this video, despite everything, uh, please subscribe so know you like this sort of thing. And remember to turn on notifications if you want to know when I upload new stuff, even when there's a long gap, like this month. I've been having kind of a rough one lately. 
Uh, if you really enjoyed this and you want to see me make more stuff like it, even if I am having a rough one, consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. Uh, I couldn't afford most of the stuff I show off on this channel, except for the occasional donation, and certainly not the studio to show them to you in without the folks backing me on there. I am incredibly grateful to all of them. Thank you all so much. And I also want to say again, thank you, Indrora, uh, for your timely assistance, without which I wouldn't be making a video right now. So, to everyone else, thanks for watching.